Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neuroplasticity Alliance's Therapy Innovation Summit 2022. I'm your host, Sherry Odom. I hope you brought pen and paper with you today because we're speaking with Dr. Matthew Antonucci, and I think you're going to want to take notes. He's got deep clinical experience in applying neuroplasticity protocols to treat a wide range of neurologic conditions. And today he's going to be speaking to us on how to use those protocols to correct a loss of self-identity in patients who have brain injury. Dr. Antonucci is a chiropractic neurologist and a functional neurology practitioner and has treated thousands of patients over the decade plus that he's been in practice. He specializes in treating uh, childhood development disorders, movement disorders, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, brain injury, and sports and neurologic enhancement programs. When he's not helping patients, he's doing clinical research or educating practitioners at the Keurig Institute. In 2015, Dr. Antonucci was bestowed the highest honor of the chiropractic profession, a lifetime fellowship at the International College of Chiropractic. He is also the current president of the American Board for Rehabilitation, and he's a review editor for the peer-reviewed uh, medical journal Frontiers in Neuroscience. He's also an associate professor at the Carrick Institute in Clinical Neuroscience. Welcome, Dr. Antonucci, to the summit. I'm so glad you're here today. Thanks for taking some time to share your expertise. Yeah, th Sherry, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm excited to share. Uh, it's, it's a passion, so hopefully people feel my passion and enjoy what we have to talk about. Yeah, so I think you have some slides you're going to share with us today, and then we'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a little presentation that I put together about something that I was very curious about and wanted to explain a little bit to people that are willing to listen about it, all about this altered state of self. I mean, it's, it's that feeling that when somebody has a concussion, uh, they just don't feel like themselves anymore. And, and how does one treat that? Uh, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do for doctors. So I figured we'd take a little time and talk about why that might happen after a concussion and how we approach it. Great. Uh, that's perfect. I look forward to it. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so once again, my name is Matt Antonucci. Uh, we prepared this presentation for the Neuroplasticity Alliance for the Therapy Innovation Summit this year in 2022, and the title is called Addressing the Altered Sense of Self Caused by a Concussion. So we, before we begin our topic, I wanted to introduce you to someone really quickly. This is my mom, and she's so funny. She always tells a story about me when I was a kid, and I think the person that I was when I was a child has really morphed me into the person that I am now. And uh, one of the things my mom always tells everybody that she talks to is when, when Matt was a kid, there was two things that just drove her crazy. When I was a kid, two things that drove her crazy. Number one was the fact that I never took the word no and listened to it. So she, I would just didn't understand the word no. It's like somebody said no and I would do it anyways. The other thing was um, I always asked why. So she would say, go clean your room. And I would say, why? And she would say, because you need to. And I said, but why? And she said, you need to do your homework. And I say, why? So it was always why. So I took that approach. And I think what that morphed into something was much more productive than it was when I was a kid. I took that approach and I did it and I applied it towards healthcare. So when I would have patients that come in after a concussion and they didn't know their left hand from their right hand, uh, I would ask myself, why? Like they used to know their right and send lefts. Now they don't know it. Uh, or if somebody says to me, like, I just don't feel like myself anymore. I might look completely normal from the outside, but inside I feel like a total mess. I would ask the question, why? And then when somebody would come to me and said, everybody says there's nothing wrong with me, I would say, no, that can't be true. I would just wouldn't accept that answer. So as we kind of move forward in this presentation, one of the things I want to talk about is exactly that. Just that example of it's not knowing your left hand from your right hand. So um, if you're watching this from around the world, maybe in a second language, you know, we have left and right uh, here in, in English. And a lot of times people do this trick where they hold up their left hand and their index finger and their thumb makes an L in order to know their left from the right. And one day I saw a patient that came into the clinic and I said, okay, um, go ahead and put up your left hand. And they went like this, they put their hands up. And I was like, Oh, you, you, do you have a difficulty with your right and left? And they're like, ever since I had my concussion, I just don't know my right and left from each other. So I said, wow, I wonder why that is. How can that possibly be? So 
as we started looking into this, I started saying, okay, well, we need to figure out why somebody like that can't know their right from left, but such a normal person can just open up a door uh, without even looking at their hand, or if you kind of take it to another level, how a receiver can catch a football that's about to go out of bounds with one foot on the ground, eyes not on the ball, and sometimes when they jump in the air, they're able actually to somehow stop their jump in midair and then get back to the ground in time to put their foot down inbounds. So how is it there's such an extreme uh, in human performance, if you will, from someone that doesn't know the right and left all the way to the flip side of the spectrum where somebody knows where their body is so acutely in space that they don't even need to use their senses in order to really utilize it. So I kind of looked for breadcrumbs. Uh, I look for paths along the way through research that kind of tells us why might it be that somebody just doesn't know where they are in space or who they are uh, or their rights from their left or how to have coordination or dexterity. And this is what I came up with. Our brain is our reality organ. And the way that the reality organ works is it takes sensory information from the outside world through receptors, relays that information to the brain like a big computer processor, and that creates something we call egocentric, allocentric, and theoretical space. Ego means self, so egocentric, like I know that I'm the center of the world uh, and the world revolves around me. Allocentric is the world is around uh, us and we are just inside of it. And theoretical could be something like a time-space continuum. We look at like Einstein or Stephen Hawkins. I mean, how did Stephen Hawkins uh, be able, how was he able to identify a black hole? I mean, literally it's devoid of sensory information. You can't see a black hole because it absorbs all light. So how is it that somebody like Stephen Hawkins can theorize what a black hole is and then prove its existence if there is no sensory information? And it has to be because the brain is processing sensory, other sensory information and inducing information out of that. And when we have that spatial awareness, we create motor activity and that motor activity then feeds back to sensory information. So this is how our brain works. Uh, everybody thinks the brain is a super complex organ where, where it is, um, but it doesn't need to be difficult to understand. If you can understand that this is the brain in its basic form, it's a sensory motor processing organ, then all of a sudden things like perception, muscle tone, speed, coordination, accuracy, cognition, emotions, or even the ability to predict what's to happen next inside the world becomes explainable through this network or the, through this cycle. So when I found out this information, it started making a lot more sense how somebody cannot know their rights from their left. While they can feel their left hand, they can feel the right hand. However, something in the processor is not allowing them to identify it in a, from a spatial perspective. And then what ends up happening is, is when we start losing brain function, we lose motor activity or coordination, changes sensory information, which then stops feeding back to the brain. And then it's a sad day for anybody that's at that point because uh, they just can't exist as a human being. And that's how some people with concussion feel. And when their brain is injured, they feel like they're no longer a human being and they can't function the way most human beings function. So then I started thinking about, okay, well, if you don't feel like yourself anymore, but you are, there has to be some sort of altered consciousness there. If you don't know your rights from your lefts, but clearly your left hand is your left hand and your right hand's from your right hand, you're disconnected from reality, which is called a, a change in consciousness. And then doing some research on consciousness itself, we came to the, the root of consciousness. It begins with a sense of self. And self is an interesting thing. Like, How do you know that you're you and not something else? Well, there are people that have studied this. And when you study what makes you you, it realistically comes from sensory information. Uh, the fact that you can feel your body, and we'll talk about things in a couple of minutes. You can feel your body, you can control your body, you identify your body, your body does what you want it to do, all create a sense of agency. But how do we begin to feel our body to begin with? Well, there's something called a Bayesian framework, uh, this Bayesian inference framework. So what Bayesian processing or Bayesian modeling looks at is it tries to predict, um, it tries to use factors to predict an outcome. So for example, if you're studying um, feeling hot, okay, and there's factors that make you feel hot, you can say, well, 
being sunny outside makes me hot. Well, if you've ever been to Minnesota in the winter time, you know that it's very sunny out there and it's very cold. So therefore, sunniness may not make you feel hot. And then you might say, well, it's the amount of clothes I wear. That's another factor. Um, more clothes I wear, the hotter I am. But once again, if you go to Minneapolis in the winter, the more clothes you put on, you can still be freezing cold. So therefore, a the amount of clothes you wear is a weak Bayesian inference model for feeling hot. But if you look at ambient temperature, the temperature in the space that you're in, that is directly correlated with how hot you feel. So what we would call it's the ambient temperature to hotness is a strong prior. Okay, and this is gonna get a little complicated, but we're gonna make it nice and simple in just a few minutes. So when we start looking at sensory processing, we try to look for strong priors that allow people to be able to identify themselves and have some embodiment. And the research is pretty conclusive is that gravity holds the status of the strongest prior. What that means is that gravity, the sense of gravity overrules all sensory information to its contrary and also can override different senses, which is kind of interesting. And then the other thing is, is that gravity, specifically vestibular processing, appears to be involved in, if not all, uh, most human behaviors. So we really start to realize is that gravity is super important in the ability of feeling like ourself. So this is an interesting quote from research. And anytime you see a parentheses with a number in between it, those are typically a PubMed reference. So you can Google those numbers, type, just type in PMID, like PubMed ID and the number or, the, or the, the digits that follow it. And you can find the papers that I read to find this information um, if you're curious about it. But from this publication, it said, our brain devotes most of its volume, energy, and computational power to, pro to process various sensory inputs from the body in order to determine and initiate appropriate corded motor behavior to the body output or to the body's desire. So that basically supports exactly what we were talking about in that earlier diagram that we have sensory input that integrates, creates motor activity, and that then creates sensory awareness of our body. And that concept creates something that's called embodiment. Um, as it says here, it's a term that describes the primary role the body plays in supporting computational circuits that realize cognition. So in order for us to think, and we're actually util utilizing this in robotic technology now, artificial intelligence, scientists are having a hard time getting robots to think because robots have, don't have embodiment. They don't have a sense of agency over themselves. They're programmed to do things, but they don't necessarily own their body. And that causes a problem for embodiment. So you can kind of see how if your sensory processing is off, you may feel like you're disconnected from your body because you might feel like it's not doing what you want it to do. And one of the things that's been interesting is to show that vestibular stimulation actually creates changes in the vestibular cortex, which then causes disintegration of bodily information and altered body ownership and embodiment. So if we do transcranial magnetic stimulation over a part of our brain called our parietal insular vestibular cortex, where we inhibit that part of the brain, people feel disconnected from their body. They almost feel like they're outside of the body, having an out-of-body experience. Uh, and that kind of starts to lead into the topic of our conversation today is it, how does a concussion make you not feel like yourself again? Uh, in order for us to figure that out, we need to understand what causes you to feel like yourself to begin with. So way back in the 1890s, James identified a couple things that uh, allowed us to feel like our self. Uh, and what he did is he broke self, the feeling of self, down to four components, the material self, the social self, the spiritual self, and the ego. The one we're going to focus on today is the material self or the material me. And like I said, you have to be able to possess your body. You have to be able to have control over it. And you also have to reside inside of it. So possession, location, and agency are the three components of feeling like yourself. And that embodiment is based upon sensory development. So one of the things that I found very interesting is if you study ontogeny, and ontogeny is the development of, of a species from conception till adulthood, um, one of the things you'll find is that 
however we were created, if you believe it was God or Allah or whoever it was or a divine spirit or anything, it, however we came about, it was pretty methodically and perfectly engineered if you start to understand it. And what you see here is that we have a hierarchy of sensory development that happens as we're born. And we're not going to go through all of this because we're kind of limited on time. But there's a couple of things I want you to realize on this. So it goes from the bottom up. That's why it's numbered one through six. Um, and it goes from the most intrinsic, so internalized sense to the most extrinsic and from earliest development to latest. And what you'll see is the very first sensory um, modality to develop is vestibular input, followed by tactile, by taste, by smell, by hearing, and last, vision. And vision doesn't really completely form until about one year, almost two years of age. So when we start looking at vestibular development, we have the point of conception, which we'll say is week zero. Um, vestibular, the vestibular organs are fully formed by seven weeks after conception, which is usually earlier than most women know that they're even pregnant. Um, and the development of this structure is actually driven by gravity and movement. This is really interesting. Um, they have done some really high definition ultrasound monitoring of embryos and fetal development. And what they realize is about week five and week six, closer towards the end of week six, week six after um, conception, what they've noticed is that fetuses or feti, embryo, I don't know the, the proper terminology for it, an embryo starts to twitch. Now this twitching is not stereotyped. It's not repetitive. There's, it's completely randomized. They put it through algorithms to see if they can figure out if there is a uh, sequence to the twitching. It's completely 100% random twitching. And they think it's just electrical currents that are being developed by the central nervous system. But the important thing is not the twitching. The important thing is what happens days after that twitching begins is the development of our vestibular system, which is a movement detector. Right? It detects movement of our head and body. So the thought is, is that the twitching now stimulates a vestibular organ and that vestibular organ now starts to be able to create sensory motor processing. Uh, now we start to be able to control the twitching as we start to have embodiment, which is in step number two, about a week later, we have, we're able to start to begin to feel our body. So now we are moving, now we feel our body, and then right after that, we start developing different types of reflexes. As a matter of fact, one of the first reflexes to develop is the rooting response um, and the grasp response. So, uh, and to enable us to put food into our mouth, which then develops taste and then smell and then hearing and vision and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see how this whole ontogeny of human development is actually pretty interesting, but more than interesting, it has clinical applications. So when somebody has a concussion, we really have to get to the root of their problem and assess all of the sensory processing beginning with vestibular and moving our way up. Okay. And then we have this, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, then we have our sensory motor interaction and we start to realize is that there is a hierarchy of motor function that occurs too, everything from muscle tone to reflexes. The controlling of our digestion and heart as an autonomic response is motor control, cognition. And then the last thing is what the basis of this conversation is, is affect. You know, affect is essentially uh, the consequence of cognitive interpretation applied to environmental stimulus creating actions. I know that sounds complex, but essentially what that means is that you feel something, you've thought about it, and then now you're thinking about doing something about it. And affect, we can also call it emotions, is a form of movement. That's why, you know, if you kind of think of it, the root word motion, emotion, uh, affects makes us do things. But what's interesting about affect, and it may not feel like this all the time, it is our most voluntary sensory motor process. Um, our affect is more controllable than our motor function. Our affect is more controllable than our thinking. Uh, it's just when we have a really healthy brain, we're able to do it. If our brain is not healthy, then it feels like our emotions drive our being rather than us driving our emotions. And all of this is created from that vestibular sense, tactile sense, smell and taste, hearing and vision. And the problem is, is when vestibular function breaks down, well, we lose a sense of embodiment, so we don't really feel our body very well. We can lose our ability to smell, taste and touch, hear and see. 
and then that starts to create a lot of problems. This is the same graphic that you're looking at here, only from a different perspective, looking at it from the side. And the significance of this is that you can kind of see all of the things that we appreciate in life, the ability to think and regulate our heart rate and our breathing and reflexes and emotions. All of that is based upon this inverted pyramid of sensory processing. And when we have an issue, let's just say a vestibular issue, we can say that's a change in sensory processing. And what happens is, is that when that vestibular uh, function is compromised or tilted in the situation, we start to see all of those processes built on top of that become skewed, uh, including thinking and emotions. So what we start to see is that these most primitive or intrinsic sensory systems, when they become compromised, lead to larger disruptions in motor control as well as affect. And this is kind of the same graphic, just kind of summarized in a different way. Uh, this is kind of tells this beautiful story of perceiving movement then creates motor tone. Motor tone creates the ability to feel our body. Once we feel our body, we have sensory motor reflexes that allow us to eat. Eating cycles then help us develop our sleep-wake cycles. And as a matter of fact, there's a really, uh, I'm full of uh, trivial information. Maybe not trivial, maybe some people find it important. But actually, ghrelin and leptin, two hormones that control our eating, actually control our sleeping as well too. And people that don't sleep well actually are more obese than people that do sleep well. So there's this, this interaction between uh, eating and autonomic circadian rhythms. And then we also know that there's a relationship between sleep and autonomic function and hearing, um, and then also motor control, vision, cognition, and affect. So we can kind of see, but based upon where things start to break down, we can, de we can interpret the degree of disruption in, from the concussion, but we can also identify how uh, much chronicity somebody might have based upon where they're affected. So going back to the sense of self, there's two really important parts of the brain that give you your self identity and also your self reality. There's the posterior parietal cortex, and that answers the question of what is me? And then there's the medial temporal lobe, which is the answers the question is what is not me. So I see I have a picture of this mannequin in an injection mold because this is really how we should think of the world. Um, we should think of the world as there's you, and then there's everything else around you that's not you. And those are processed in two very different parts of the brain. So someone that doesn't know whether something is on the right or the left of their room is different than someone doesn't know their right versus their left, two different parts of the brain. But it takes those two things working together in order to have a good representation of where we are in space. So if we have an injury to either one of those areas of the brain, our identity of self can be compromised and we can feel like we're not our same self again. And remember, so the I, what am I? I is defined by all of your sensory input. And the world around you is constructed by what is not you. And when we talked about intrinsic senses versus extrinsic senses, vestibular sense is the most intrinsic because it feels the movement of your body. Um, and, it, and also, like if you've ever been in an amusement park ride and you accelerate too quickly, you get that feeling inside of your stomach. Um, where we, as we start getting into tactile sense, we're starting to look at our, the surface of our skin, which is a little bit more distal or more extrinsic. But then when we start getting to things like, um, like taste, we don't taste things unless it's actually in our body. So therefore, the sense of taste is probably the most distal sense. Then smell, we can smell things from a foot away. Hearing, we can hear things from feet away. And vision, we can see things from miles away. So those things that are remote senses help construct our environment, while the senses that are in us help construct ourselves. Now remember, we, we started by talking about gravity, how gravity and vestibular perception drives all of this information. Um, and the, realistic is, the reality is, is that the consistency of gravity is important for, for human beings. And this is a whole other conversation that I'm really interested in, maybe we'll talk about this another time, is, uh, is, is aerospace neurology. Um, you know, when Elon Musk says he wants to uh, colonize Mars, there's a lot of thinking that has to be done there. And hopefully if you're paying attention, you're going to say, wait a second, there's a problem there because conception occurs and right after conception, we start to perceive gravity. If there's altered gravity on Mars, does that mean 
people that are born on Mars might be different than the people that are born on Earth. And the possibility is very likely. Um, but we're talking about concussion, not Martians. So when we start looking at gravity, the ubiquity, meaning always there, the reliability, the consistency of gravity, the fact that we're always being pulled perpendicular to the center of the Earth, um, provides us with a constant that's always there that we just can we can anchor ourselves to. And having anchors in life, and a lot of people know this uh, from other less neurological mechanisms by having, let's just say, money in the bank. We feel anchored financially. Uh, by having a significant other, we feel anchored emotionally. So human beings love anchors because it allows us to not worry about something so we can devote resources to other things. Well, if there's a disruption in the way you perceive gravity, uh, then we lose our one only anchor. So to keep things nice and simple, gravity is the only terrestrial constant. You know, the this brightness of the world, the temperature of the world, you know, the uh, everything you could think about on this planet is inconsistent to a certain degree. Gravity is the only one consistent in our brain has developed uh, in order to rely upon that in order to create this sense of self and how we relate to the world. So gravity should always be pulling things straight down through the center of our body towards the earth if your, if your brain is processing gravity appropriately. But what happens if you perceive gravity pulling you at a different angle or to say it differently, what if you're tilted, gravity would pull you differently and you would create completely different body responses. You might put your arm out, you might tilt your head, you might you know, circulate more blood to one side of your body versus the other so you can catch yourself from falling. It's all based upon the direction that gravity is pulling us towards the earth. And our senses create a representation of our body in concert with that gravity. So the reason why you can look out and it looks the floor is down there and the ceiling is up there is because gravity you're, you're, you're used to seeing people walk on the floor. Otherwise, if you're used to seeing people walk on the ceiling, that would be down and this would be up. So you can kind of see gravity changes everything, uh, including vision. As a matter of fact, when astronauts go into space, there's reports in the first 72 hours of some astronauts looking out into the space shuttle and all of a sudden their whole visual axis flips upside down. Um, and that would just make me so anxious. I'm sure it would make you anxious too. Their eyeballs aren't turning inside their head, but what ends up happening is light hitting their retina, going to their occipital lobe, and then being interpreted by the rest of the brain saying, wait a second, gravity's not here anymore. So gravity used to be down there and anti-gravity used to be up here and things just start to flip because gravity's not that way anymore. So it's, it's crazy how that, that all happens when we start studying aerospace medicine. So here's a nice, easy way to look at things. Most of us are familiarized with Google Sheets or spreadsheets. Um, spreadsheets are made out of rows and columns. And inside those rows, we can have anything, right? You can have a formula, you can have text. Some of the newer software, excuse me, allow you to put like graphs inside of each one of these cells, or you can put an image inside of one of them. So the point being is that just like our world, anything can be inside of each one of these cells. And one of the things that has to happen for Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets to work well is the columns always have to be vertical and the rows always have to be horizontal. So in our life, gravity keeps the columns vertical and the rows are always perpendicular to columns. So what ends up happening for us is we may have, like if you're out in a kayak or something, this is what you might be experiencing the world like. Your hand is in columns number one through five, and, and, and I'm sorry, rows one through five, columns H and I, and the trees in the distance are out there in, in column A and rows seven through 16. So that allows us to say, okay, this is our orientation in space. And once again, it's all based upon gravity. So let's talk about how a concussion affects all of this. We know that concussion involves perception and sensory information and can distort it. Um, and we, and that's how we start to function in the world. So there's tons of research showing that concussion disrupts our sensory motor integration and can also affect our learning, everything from implicit learning or explicit learning. So things that you, uh, learn by somebody teaching you and things that you learn just by existing inside the world. 
But the problem is with concussions is that we really don't know what a concussion is still. Today, there's over 30 official definitions of a concussion. And the term concussion is only really used to describe a sport-related mild traumatic brain injury. If you are, like for example me, if I happen to be on camera here and I trip and I fell and I hit my head, I didn't have a concussion by researchers' definition. I had a mild traumatic brain injury. However, me, the same exact person, if I'm outside in the yard uh, playing you know, catch with my friend and I trip and fall, I hit my head, because I was in a sporting scenario, then I had a concussion. You can see how crazy this is. Just the difference between what you're doing determines whether you've had a mild traumatic brain injury and concussion. So if you're in the military or if you're a civilian or if you're participating in a non-sporting event, you, you don't have concussions. You have mild traumatic brain injuries. If you participate in a sporting event, you have a concussion. But concussions are mild traumatic brain injuries. So you can kind of start to see how confusing this gets. It's really shaking us all up. And the other thing is, is that uh, there's a lot of people that are, are really discussing and debating this one thing about the difference between concussion and MTBI not being just semantical. If I told you, or Sherry, if I told you, Sherry, you had a concussion, or if I said, Sherry, you had a mild traumatic brain injury, you would, ex you would think that one sounds more severe than the other. Uh, and most people, by a, by a uh, survey, research survey, showed that they believe that mild traumatic brain injuries were more severe than concussions. Now this has implications. The implications of that might be that somebody who was told they have a concussion has been shown to return to sports or life earlier than someone that has been told they have a mild traumatic brain injury. So you might say, okay, well, we need to stop calling it concussion then so people are safer. Well, doesn't stop there. People that are told they have a mild traumatic brain injury take longer to heal than someone that has a concussion. And that's the psychological component of feeling that you're, you're more injured versus just being just, just having a concussion. So at the very foundation of all of this, uh, we realize that we have a whole lot more work to do on concussion and even identifying, because if you can't identify what a concussion is, now all of a sudden all of the research statistics on how often they occur changes, and then all of the um, diagnostic procedures change because concussion has a certain criteria, mild traumatic has a different criteria. Um, and then also the way medicine works today is all treatment is based upon the diagnosis. So you can see how maybe somebody may be defined as having a concussion or an MTBI by one doctor and not by another and their treatment would be completely different. Maybe one person wouldn't get treatment at all. Maybe the other one would get unnecessary treatment. So this is a big problem that we're having. So let's be nice and simple here. And this is from research, uh, a paper, you have their paper right there. And it said, a concussion is a traumatically induced disturbance of brain function that can't be explained by drugs, medications, or another condition. I feel like this is the best definition of what a concussion is uh, because it leaves lots of room uh, for interpretation. Uh, it also leaves it uh, so that there's a very low threshold but it also says whatever you're experiencing can't be explained by something else so that we're ruling out other conditions and ruling in a lot of different function because um, any disturbance in brain function. So if you're disoriented or if you have a headache or you have numbness and tingling or if you uh, don't know what time it is, all of those things can then qualify you to have a concussion. And with that being said, we've probably heard the statistic a million times that there's 1.4 to 3.8 million concussions per year in the United States, but we need to look into a little bit deeper than that. Uh, one of the great things about uh, the pro Canadian province of Ontario, and there's many great things about those folks up there, is that with their medical system, they have every patient that goes into the medical system reported on why they're in there. So it becomes a researcher's paradise. Uh, we have a lot of great statistics there. And what they actually showed is that the uh, incidence, the annual occurrence of concussion is about 1.2% of the population. So that basically says that 1.2% of the population will present to the hospital with a concussion per year. Um, however, same research says that only one in 10 individuals seek medical care for a suspected concussion. So what we can do is we can actually multiply that 1.2 times 10 
to get 12% um, of, the, of the population that actually has a concussion every year. And if we start looking at those numbers in the United States alone, that puts us over, um, you know, what's the number? I think it's over 40 million uh, concussions per year. So that's a lot. And then you look at this next point, as many 50% of all sports concussions go unreported. So the reality is, is that we have so many people sustaining concussions every year, we don't even have track of it. And just in case you thought that, well, 12% is a lot, but is it really that much? Well, I'll tell you what, it's double the number of annual cases of diabetes being diagnosed every single year. So a lot of people know that diabetes is a problem, while concussions are twice a problem than diabetes. And here's a, a great video for you guys. It's gonna be no audio, but what I want people to understand, and this is, uh, this is a human cadaver that I had permission to, uh, to, to prosect and to use for educational purposes. Uh, so please don't take any pictures or videos of this. Um, not like you would be able to identify the human being who they are, but their wishes was for this to be for education, not for anything else. Um, but one of the things that we can see is, those are my hands holding that person's head and what I want you to see is when I move that head, how much movement there is inside the brain. Ready? So that's just a little bit of movement as if somebody's saying yes. Now take into consideration that um, there's no meninges around this brain, there's no cerebral spinal fluid, the blood is not in the body anymore. So there's a lot of things that are not occupying volume in the brain, but some of us have heard that the brain is the consistency of jello or pudding. Um, well, now you can actually see it. Uh, and so now when you start seeing, watching a football game, or if you watch some of those sports bloopers, or if you see people on uh, what's that, Chive TV that are flipping over railings and falling on their head and America's Funniest Home Videos, which I don't find funny anymore, uh, you start to watch those and you think of this image and you realize how much injury we're actually causing to the brain. There's a lot of researchers that talked about what happens in the brain during a concussion, and what we start to realize is that shearing stress is probably one of the most impactful um, injuries that happen with the brain. So shearing, uh, we'll talk about this in just a moment, uh, shearing basically causes injury due to stretching, if you will. And the injury happens mostly in the brainstem as well as the thalamus. So with that brainstem is where we have our vestibular centers, we have our arousal centers, we have a lot of our autonomic centers that regulate our heart rate and blood pressure and sweating. And then our thalamus is our major sensory relay center. So you can see that if somebody has a concussion, the criteria for embodiment or feeling like yourself are processed in those areas of the brain. The thalamus is the sensory processing center of our brain. Now all of a sudden you start to realize, well, hey, because of this injury, someone may have injured either their vestibular system or the processing of that information, and now they may not feel like themselves anymore. And then what happens after a concussion is we have this changes in brain function. We have areas of our brain that become hyper excited and other areas of our brain that become dormant, and that causes changes in our brain. Uh, and when those changes occur for over a period of time, we start developing plasticity. And now we always talk about plasticity being a good thing. Well, let's be real, there's bad plasticity too. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a great example of plasticity, neuroplasticity, but it's bad, okay? This situation where we have hypermetabolic activity in some areas of our brain, let's just say that that was in a part of our brain that causes dizziness and we're spinning and spinning and spinning, and all of a sudden now that part of the brain is starting to heal up, but because it became so efficient, so plastic, now you have persistent dizziness. Or the other areas of the brain that had a hypometabolic activity or decreased function, you remember plasticity is also one of the, the criteria of plasticity is use it and improve it or use it and lose it. So if you have decreased activity, we start losing function of our brain and now all of a sudden we are uh, in a bad situation and we can develop some of the different symptoms you see of concussion. Now there are over 50 different symptoms of concussion. Uh, here are the top 10, but one of the things that we like to look at is how do we approach each one of these? Fatigue, trouble concentrating, anxiety, memory issues, neck pain, sleep issues, dizziness, back pain, fogginess, blurred vision. 
you know, if you're a medical doctor, you're looking at this and saying, oh man, that's a lot of medications I've got to prescribe somebody. If you're a psychologist, you're saying, wow, I can only help a third of those. If you're a physical therapist, you're saying, wow, I can only really help two or three of those things. Um, so we need to figure out a way to address all of those things, and that's through an understanding of what actually happens in concussion. So with concussion, there are seven different categories of symptoms. We call these phenotypes of concussion that allow individuals to be clustered into each one of these for us to figure out which are their most prevalent symptoms and which ones are not being affected, and that also helps direct the course of care. But the one we're gonna be talking about since we talked about gravity and we talked about uh, self-identity is vestibular. When we start looking at the vestibular phenotype of concussions, um, it, there's a 600%, 630% increase of odds of having prolonged concussion symptoms if you have dizziness with your concussion. So say that differently, you have a concussion, you're dizzy, you can pretty much anticipate that it's gonna take you six times longer to get better than someone that didn't have dizziness. And also we know that concussion can injure both the inner ear or the central vestibular system or both at the same time. And all of the different pathways associated with vestibular function can be injured with concussion. That's how concussion can actually cause more than dizziness. It can cause fatigue, headache, back pain, neck pain, blurred vision, fogginess, changes in blood pressure, mood changes, basically making you feel not like yourself. Uh, and also, patients with vestibular injuries perform worse on cognitive tasks, including short-term memory, concentration, math, and even reading. So vestibular injuries are way more than just dizziness. And we have to look at this from a different perspective. And we all in medicine try to be very linear. Uh, we try to say, do uh, what we call if this, then that scenarios. If you have strep throat, then I prescribe that antibiotic. Okay, so if this, then that is very linear. However, what we really start to realize is the brain is not linear at all. It actually uh, embodies, uh, no pun intended there, it actually embodies a more of the chaos theory versus the reductionalist theory because we can have a vestibular issue that causes dizziness and the dizziness causes eye movements that are unwanted nystagmus or whatever, which causes blurred vision. Blurred vision can cause anxiety Anxiety can cause you to sweat, increase your heart rate. Increasing your heart rate can then cause you to have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can then cause you to have a stroke. So you can kind of see how one thing can extrapolate to a million different things. And when we start looking at the nonlinear modeling of vestibular dysfunction, in the research it shows that people with vestibular issues can have TMJ dysfunction, personality changes, immune dysregulation. Uh, they can have poor math abilities. They can have pain in different parts of their body that are not even injured. So the research supports all this. So it's kind of like the butterfly effect, right? Where you have a concussion and your vestibular system is affected um, and everything in your body could be affected. So it's almost like you know, you've probably heard the butterfly flex. Somewhere in the world, a butterfly flaps its wings and it causes a tornado somewhere else on the planet just because of the movement of air. So that's kind of what we deal with when it comes to working in the brain. So you can kind of understand how people look at the brain and say it's a very difficult organ to fix. And there's a whole lot of connectivity of these different nuclei of the brain uh, where we have things like eye movement affected, balance affected, our sleep-wake cycles, emotional regulation, digestion or visceral control, immune control. Uh, your vestibular nuclei are connected in all sorts of areas. And, if you've ever seen a, a connectome, basically what this shows you is that all the way down at the bottom there at about six o'clock or seven o'clock on the bottom, that's where the vestibular nucleus is. And all of those green lines coming out of it are connections to different areas of the brain. And you can see that the vestibular nucleus is connected with at least 60% of the brain. Uh, so it's very pervasively innervated and affects many different things. And the, the challenge is, is that even people that are understanding vestibular uh, don't really understand the magnitude of its implications. One of the things that we uh, have identified is that when we start looking at individuals who have a concussion, um, the different part of our um, vestibular system is affected than we usually think. Uh, typically, when you think of vestibular function, we think of things that move, detect our movement side to side or up and down or rotation. 
we don't really think about things that detect side to side movement, up and down movement, such as gravity. And what they've shown is that about 30% of all concussions have injuries to the uh, ability for us to perceive gravity appropriately or translation. This is why a lot of people with concussion get car sick uh, because those structures are, are injured. And it's also the same reason why some people have difficulty uh, looking at things that are really close to them. Um, it's also the same difficulty reason why people have difficulty going up and down elevators and escalators with concussions. So what's the clinical relevance of all this? I wanna tell you how I took that information, asking that question why, why does somebody not know their right or the left? Why does somebody not feel like themselves? And what did I do about it? So that's one of the things that I feel like I've been very blessed with. It's, it's, a, it's an ability to have problem solving or look at things from different perspectives to try to figure out what is the one thing that's causing all of those things to happen. So what I did is I looked at a whole bunch of things. I started saying, okay, well, we're, we feel ourselves and we know where we are in space through a couple of different senses, hearing, vision, proprioception, and vestibular. So I said, well, let me go in the research and figure out what the research says uh, to evaluate those things. So we have things like low sound localization with your eyes closed, trying to figure out where something is. Uh, sacodometry, looking at fast eye movements. There's a test called the thumb localization test where you have to close your eyes and grab the tip of your thumb with your eyes closed. Uh, that tells us our ability to perceive our body. And then for vestibular, we have the video head impulse test where we take somebody's head and we move it really quickly back and forth. So we did all of these things and we also added another one. Uh, we added this subjective visual vertical task. Um, you can actually do this for $5. You buy a bucket, um, you basically cut a line inside the bucket, and then you, on the outside of the bucket, you hang a string with the washer on it with a protractor on it, and the person puts their head inside the bucket and they see a horizontal line because you turn it sideways. And what's to happen is the person has to rotate the bucket until it's just the line is completely vertical, and on the outside, the examiner sees how off they are compared to gravity. And what we start to see is that healthy subjects usually can get that line within one degree of upright. However, individuals with concussion are not as accurate. Um, they are often way off from vertical. So that tells us that we have an aberrancy in perceiving gravity. So this is where gravity should be pulling. And if you see that washer off to the side like that, that means that somebody has uh, an abnormal interpretation of gravity. The other thing that we start to see is when somebody has uh, ab abnormal activity of their vestibular system from the gravity perspective, when I turn my head like this, my eyes rotate the opposite way. So I started wondering, can we see static uh, cyclo deviation of the eyes in individuals who have a poor sense of gravity? And those people should have a poor sense of self and therefore not feel like themselves. Um, so we started looking at that, and this is that ocular tilt response that I just talked about. So when gravity is pulling you straight down, your eyes should be uh, level and not twisting. When we tilt our head to one side or the other, our eyes should counter roll and also change their, um, their vertical level so that we can keep our eyes in alignment with the horizontal plane. So one way that we evaluate this is using something called a Maddox rod. It's a tool that's used in optometry as well as in orthoptics. Uh, to measure ocular alignment. And one of the things that we find is that um, people that have concussions often have misalignment of their eyes. Now, the misalignment of the eyes that we see uh, with individuals who have this disconnected sense of self, poor perception of gravity, and in having these affect changes, depression, anxiety, or um, you know, not feeling like, like I said, like themselves or not feeling right, when they look through that prism, it should be straight up and down or straight side to side, but often people see this. They see these prisms on a diagonal, which means that their eyes are twisted inside of their head. And what we try to do is we try to figure out if there's a way to make them straight. And one of the things that we realized is that if you tip your head over, uh, what ends up happening is those lines start to straighten out because you're inducing that ocular counter roll, which then corrects it. And the degree in which somebody tilts their head over to the side is often correlated with their subjective visual vertical, meaning that they have that distortion of gravity that matches their eyes. So how do we tie all this back into not so technical scientific stuff? Well, let's go back to our spreadsheet. And if you remember, we in our spreadsheet, we had 
our hands and our oar and our kayak and the trees, well, if you have that abnormal perception of gravity, this is essentially what happens. Gravity is not pulling straight towards the earth anymore. Now it's pulling on an angle and you can see our hands are in different locations, the trees are in different locations, the boat is in different locations, and now our map of the world is completely off. So we feel disconnected from the world, number one, and we also feel disconnected from ourself, number two. And then there's one other task that we do just to kind of evaluate this, and this was just something we did by accident just to see if it uh, correlated. We had people do this old, old test called finger, nose, finger test. It's basically when you touch your nose, you touch the examiner's finger back and forth, and we're looking for tremors or ataxia or dysmetria uh, or things of that nature. What we were looking for is how accurate somebody was with their eyes open compared to their eyes closed. Because if you lose your visual reference, then you're relying all upon gravity and proprioception in order to be able to hit that target that you had in your memory. And we found with high correlations that this correlated with individuals had that abnormal perception of gravity. So what you should be thinking if you're a doctor watching this is that, wow, there's some pretty easy tests that we can do that, that I, my team and I figured out to figure out if somebody's perception of gravity is altered. And then you're probably saying to yourself, well, what does he do about it? And we'll get there in just literally one minute. We've got a couple slides left. Um, but if you're a patient, this is also something you can do at home. I mean, you don't even need another person to do it. You can look at your computer screen. You could use my nose right now and just touch my nose, touch your nose back and forth and close your eyes and see if you can still get your finger on my nose on the TV screen. And that'll tell you how well you're able to perceive your spatial awareness. Healthy individuals should be able to get eight out of 10 uh, back and forths directly on the target. When I say directly on the target, I mean, it's like finger pad to finger pad. Even a little miss like this, I count as being off because this is the resolution of our brain. Our brain should be that accurate, even with our eyes closed. So healthy individuals should be between seven and nine or six and 10. Uh, if you're outside of six, then you know you definitely have a problem. If you're between six and eight, you're probably saying, hey, there's probably not great processing here. We need to work on this. So then what we ended up doing is we took the number from the, um, from the subjective visual vertical test on the bucket. We took the information from the ocular counter roll and also from the finger nose finger task. And we had people tilt their head to that position and try that task again. And people, nearly 90% of people that had these really abnormal skews of vertical, um, when they tilted their head, they were right on. The Maddox rod became normal. The finger nose finger testing became normal. And as a matter of fact, even things like muscle tone and uh, people even felt happier in that position. Everything started to change. So then I started saying, okay, we're on to something here because when we rotate our head one way, the world looks like it rotates the opposite way. Uh, and everybody just stop for a second and try that. Tilt your head over to the side. And what you realize as your head goes to the right, the world spins opposite to the left. So I said to myself, I wonder if we can give an optical illusion to change somebody's perception of where they are in space. So what I did is I bought this video off of like deposit photos or some website. And I started making people watch this. So go ahead and watch the center of the screen there, or the center of that spinning pinwheel. And what you're gonna see is when that pinwheel stops, you're gonna see movement even after it stops. Okay, and hopefully it's not cycling over again. It is, it's playing over and over again. So we'll stop it in a second. Keep watching the center and then it'll hit stop. And you can see the pinwheel actually reverses its direction. If you don't see that, you probably have an issue with vestibular processing. Because normal people, or I shouldn't say normal, uh, neurotypical individuals, no injury, uninjured individuals, they see uh, a, a, an opposite movement of that pinwheel when it stops. People that have concussions often do not. So what we found is that utilizing this one simple video for the appropriate patients, so we see how this kind of rotates uh, counterclockwise, that would be someone that needed to rotate their head to the right changed their ability to understand where they are in space. But over time, when we did this over and over and over and over again, and sometimes combining it with other sensory stimulus, we were able to reprogram or create plasticity 
in their brain pathways for their perception of gravity and it changed a lot of different things. So here's the take home for, from what we talked about today. Our brain wants to know where we are in space and able to be able to know who we are. We need to know who we are in order to feel, think, and move appropriately. Gravity is a significant contributor to that. Concussions can alter our sense of gravity. There's an interplay between the vestibular function, ocular position, and spatial awareness. And also, when we start looking at some of the different torsions of our eyes and vestibular function and spatial awareness, we can affect that with uh, sensory stimuli, such as that spinning wheel or vestibular rehabilitation, and a whole bunch of other th different therapies based upon every single person's presentation. So I just wanted to say thank you for humoring me. I know some of this might have just been more for me than for you, but hopefully you got out something out of it because I find this stuff so interesting. And this is the thought process I go through with every single patient that I see. We try to figure out why. Why are they feeling the way they are? And I won't take no for an answer when somebody says that this person can't get better or there's nothing wrong with them. So if there's ever anything that I can do to be of assistance, you can scan that QR code. It'll give you my information. You can also find me on DrAntonucci.com and Carrick Institute, where I, where I teach all around the world. So that's my presentation. Um, and I know that, Sherry, I think you wanted to have a little bit of a chat as well, too, didn't you? Yeah, I sure did. Thank you, Dr. Antonucci, for going through the detail on how all those sensory components integrate and their ordinality and being able to interpret the sensory data. We, we've discussed in the summit a lot about the timing for applying different neuroplastic-based approaches and protocols, and I think that really sort of brings it home on why that order is appropriate and how you need to, or a practitioner like yourself, needs to understand the diagnosis of where a person is to be able to treat uh, correctively, yeah. and, and I think that really shortens probably the amount of time that your patient's I uh, have to spend in that recovery time frame. Absolutely, yeah, our, our programs are only five days long. So I don't, I don't see people for a long time. We have an intensive program because plasticity is created through repetition and intensity. And as long as you're doing the right thing, the right thing creates quick changes. So that's what we like to see. So you're 100% you're accurate on that. Yeah, and now I, I guess I have to question the five days, right? So can you explain that just a little bit more? So you're only seeing your patients for five days or? Yep, yep. so I see my patients twice a day, 90 minutes in duration each session uh, for five days straight. And this comes after, I, I've been doing this now for almost 14 years. I've tried every possible combination of it. Um, and I took what, uh, there's a, a researcher, really good, uh, really good guy, a colleague of mine out of the University of Arizona, Jeffrey Klein, and he kind of created the 10 principles of plasticity. Um, and he published these things. And I started looking at those and I realized the intensive model for neuroplastic changes is the best model. Now the problem with a five day program, doing something 90 minutes twice a day for five days straight, if you're doing the wrong thing, you really mess people up real quick. And I've done that too. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, we're not all perfect. And we call it being in practice for a reason because we should be getting better at every single day. Um, but the reality is, is that I found that after seeing people for two weeks, for you know, twice a week, for six weeks or 12 weeks, that I get the best outcomes in this five-day program. And I also now have had patients say, well, if I come for five days, can I come for two weeks? It's almost like I call it the American way, right? If, if a little bit is good, then a lot has to be better. And what we end up finding is that um, in the second week, people just are so fatigued that they can't, they can't get any benefit out of it. So it's the sweet spot for us. It's, it's that twice a day for five days, and we really make great changes. As a matter of fact, um, some of the research that I've been doing on my own data shows that we get about 60% improvement in five days. And these, on the average, patients have had concussion symptoms of those patients for over two and a half years. So by the research standards, they're considered to have permanent concussion symptoms, um, and we're getting 60% improvement in just five days. And are you sending them home with a bunch of homework, or do you see them later in their recovery process after some time has gone by? Yes and yes. Uh, they definitely get homework. So the basis of the program is, okay, it starts off by me saying, let me figure what's going on here. Then once I figure out what's going on here, let me create a plausible solution that might work. And then at the midweek, we do a reevaluation and we say it's either working or it's not. 
If it's not working, then I change things up or I might just say, you know, this is not going to be a successful case. But then on midweek when we say this is working, we don't really change anything up from that point. Now it's just creating plasticity, creating plastic changes, a lot of repetition and intensity. So my goal is by the end of five days to show you that we figured something out, we determined a solution, I trained you how to do it, now go do it for free. I don't want you to pay me to do something that you can do on your own. And I typically tell people, let's let's get you back in here in three and four months for either at least a reevaluation just to see where you're at, or maybe a second round of uh, you know some some functional neurology care. That that's a very different approach, I think, from most of the people that we've spoken to who are neuroplasticity based practitioners. Usually, there's a two to three week protocol. I would say uh, there are several that I've spoken to that are like that. Um, the Listening Center in Toronto is one of them that comes to mind where you go in, you're there for a week to two weeks, and then you've got a three month hiatus and then you come back and they reassess. And I, I know from personal experience that that has worked very well, but you have to do the homework. And yeah, that, yeah. absolutely. And those, those are intensive models on their own. But I think my perspective was going all the way back to grade school when I had to learn my multiplication tables. I didn't study them for an hour twice a week. Right. You know, I would every single night I come home with my mom and I would drill my multiplication tables every single night. And then, you know, sometimes in the morning, too, especially if it's like the sevens, right? The sevens, those were the hardest ones. Um, so I spent a whole lot of times on the sevens and the threes when I was a kid, because the more time you spend on it, the more time you spend drilling on it, the more you'll learn it, you more plasticity you'll create. If I only study those sevens and those threes for one hour, twice a week for 12 weeks, I might get it but then I might not get it in time for the test. So a lot of times people just want to get better quick and I would, you know, I understand that. So that type of a model works really well, but that doesn't say the other models don't work well. Um, this is just what I find to work best for me, but just like it's intensive for the patients, it's intensive for me. Uh, it's, it's exhausting, right? And the thing is, is that when you have people coming in for five days, there's no opportunity for a snow day or for a hurricane day or to be sick. So there's got to be this balance between the doctor's life and the patient's life and the, everybody's desire for them to get well. So everybody does a little different permutation of that. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, describing how that differs, right? From that intense protocol to something that's a little more extenuated. You know, you mentioned just briefly and touched on some brain imaging. I, what but I didn't get a sense that that's really incorporated into your practice overall. What's your perspective on brain imaging and how do you use it if you do? I think brain imaging is fantastic for diagnosing. Uh, well, let's first of all, let's talk about two different types of brain imaging. There's, there's traditional brain imaging and there's functional brain imaging. I think traditional brain injury, uh, imaging has a great place in, a, in the acute management of concussion or brain injuries. So to make sure there's not a brain bleed, uh, things like that. Um, otherwise, it tells you nothing about a concussion. As a matter of fact, the research is pretty conclusive that uh, CAT scans, MRIs are pretty well useless when it comes to mild brain injuries because they don't show anything. Um, and then we start looking at functional imaging. I think that there's a lot there to unpack. I think that functional imaging, such, such as fMRI, DTI, spec scanning, uh, PET scanning, things like that, things that will measure function are the way to go because we know that concussion is a functional disorder. So if you can measure function with imaging, then all of a sudden now we have a better diagnostic criteria. You know, for example, you're watching these football players and sometimes they get hit on the football field and everybody's, like, oh my goodness, they're concussed. Take them out of the play. They go back in the locker room and then they're cleared and they're back at play. However, that's probably just because of the gray area and the concussion definitions. If we had something that was, no pun intended here, black and white, right, where it's either you have a concussion or you don't, and imaging can provide that, so can bio, blood biomarkers that are coming out. I think that's great because then we can have the binary, yes, you're concussed, or no, you're not. However, that's kind of like a utopian dream, right, where that's going to happen. Uh, as far as my practice and the way I practice, I, I practice functional neurology, um, and a image is just that. Like for example, I, I think I may have shared this with you earlier. You can take a picture of you and I right now, and that would be accurate for right now. But in a couple hours from now, I might be getting lunch, which is a completely different environment. I might have different clothes on, doing different things. So therefore, the image doesn't represent me at that time. 
So when I see a patient in my office, they might have had imaging a couple of weeks ago while they're you know, super anxious or maybe they were really relaxed or maybe they, whatever their situation was and their brain looked like that that day, I try to find diagnostic or clinical proxies for the imaging, you know, such as that finger nose finger test or the eye alignment or you know, hundreds of other different clinical bedside examination procedures that give me this, the functional state of the brain because I can perform those in seconds and re-perform them seconds later to see if there's changing. It's kind of hard to get an fMRI done every five minutes uh, if you want to figure out if something's getting better or worse. So I don't use imaging in my practice for, um, for I'll call it management or treatment, but I love imaging to make sure that we understand that there's no brain bleeds and to also determine if there's actually um, some tract disruption, gray, gray matter disruption, white matter tract disruption, uh, because that allows us to get a better prognosis, um, but also it can explain why somebody might not be getting better. So I think it has its place, but I just don't use it from a therapeutic perspective. Yeah, and maybe that will change as the, you know, Brian Johnson gets his mobile um, imaging system up and we're yeah. able to get real-time data. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so some of the other innovations that are out there, uh, these um, brainware systems that allow you to help uh, improve your mood and uh, I know there's some photobiomodulation ones. Do you use those in your practice? Yeah, I love photobiomodulation. I mean, if you just... If you just look at the mechanism behind it, it's literally like a brain hack. It, the photobiomodulation, the photons go right to the mitochondria of the cell and help it produce adenosine triphosphate, which is an energy molecule, decreases inflammation, inflammation, increases blood flow. All of the things that you want from somebody with a concussion, but all the things that I want before I do treatment with somebody. I want them to have a lot of high quality fuel in the tank. Uh, so I usually use photobiomodulation. Actually, I have, I've got something right here. Uh, so this is a photobiomodulation helmet that has a whole bunch of arrays inside of it, and I can control wherever I want it to shine in the brain, and I can control how bright it is and the frequency. Uh, so it really allows me to customize things. So if I see somebody has a problem, let's just say, be keeping it real simple, with their right frontal lobe, I can stimulate that area specifically with this helmet. Or if they have a problem with their left occipital lobe, I can stimulate that area with the helmet just to provide them a little extra fuel so that they can respond well to treatment. However, I will say though, my opinion is that photobiomodulation, although it releases brain-derived neurotropic factor, increases blood flow, has shown uh, to have synaptogenesis, I still look at it as a fuel-based treatment. It provides fuel. So uh, if you've got a Ferrari sitting in the driveway and you put high premium gas in it, but you never turn the engine on, I don't think it's gonna drive very well. Uh, so I think my perspective is things like these wearables, photobiomodulation with customized, personalized uh, neuroplastic activities. Yeah, and I so you mentioned that you, you've got to have that in conjunction with movement and all of the other things that create neuroplasticity. Do you have an opinion on nutrition that's, uh, that you're integrating into your protocol? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that we always do is we send out a questionnaire first uh, to all of our patients just to figure out if they have any nutritional deficiencies because you remember we said our brain processes our environment and a part of our internal environment is the chemistry. I always say that you know, very good brain healthcare has a couple of components, brain, body, mind, and chemistry. I think all of those things need to be addressed. So someone who's anemic, for example, um, because they don't have enough iron or vitamin C or B vitamins or copper or whatever it might be. Um, if that's the case, you're not going to get very far with any type of neuroplastic rehab or you know, implying neuroplasticity in treatment because they can't produce ATP, which is the energy molecule that helps create new synapses. So yeah, I definitely believe in nutrition and I think it's all kind of similar to photobiomodulation. It's about putting good fuel in the tank so that you could be a high performance machine as far as creating new connections the way they're supposed to be made. Dr. Carey, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Antonucci, uh, that kind of leads to my next question. Yeah. <laughs> is, <laughs> you're, you spend a lot of time training practitioners and I know you do that through the Carrick Institute. I, I was gonna ask you if you could explain to our readers what that is and, and who Dr. Carrick is and, and why he's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So Dr. Carrick uh, is a chiropractor by training. Uh, he's the pioneer in functional neurology. Uh, 1979, he kind of thought of this idea that uh, neurology is not black or white, it's shades of gray, and we can make people function better uh, when they're not functioning well, even if they have disease or if they don't. Um, and he put that into practice for over, uh, over two decades, um, and he started having the obligation to start teaching people what he did, so he formed the Carrick Institute. Um, the Carrick Institute has trained over 19,000 doctors at this point around the world, um, and we continue to do so. As a matter of fact, uh, just in a, tomorrow I leave for Amsterdam to go teach a course in Amsterdam for the Carrick Institute on concussion. So we're, we're offering courses all over the world to all different types of doctors, chiropractors, physical therapists, athletic trainers, medical doctors, you name it, uh, we've trained them. Um, and the whole basis is brain-centered healthcare. Uh, we have nutrition programs, we have brain injury programs, we have human performance programs, um, and Dr. Carrick has been my mentor um, for almost 15 years now, and I did a, a year and a half fellowship underneath him, working with him every single day, so I've got to, uh, had the opportunity to learn from him, and I also uh, sustained all of the, you know, difficulty, we'll say that, that he put me through to learn, right? Because we learn under stress, right? That's when we learn best. So he, he definitely made that happen for me too. Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, a lot of uh, the questions that I get through this summit have been on, how do I evaluate these different types of neuroplastic protocols? You've got some that are focused, very focused on maybe, you know, auditory processing or practitioners like yourself who are really looking at a wide range of things. I know we've talked a lot about concussion today, but uh, you do, you treat children with developmental delays, sports injuries, uh, you know, a wide range. Uh, what, what kind of advice can you give these practitioners and individuals out there who are really trying to evaluate when do I send one of my patients to uh, Dr. Antonucci or, you know, how do I evaluate all the options that are out there? Who is the right practitioner to work with at a specific point in time? That's a fantastic question, um, and I wish there was one solid answer. It's almost like, what is a concussion, right? Um, the reality is, uh, if you're a practitioner, I think absorbing that concept that we went over today of the sensory hierarchy as well as the motor integration, then you really get the answer out of that. That's not coming from me. That's coming from research, basically saying that our brain develops in a certain way, and that affects the way that we move and the way that we think. So if you have a patient who's having trouble thinking, right, you can't do math, they have executive function changes, maybe they're depressed, maybe they're a little anxious, don't uh, look deeper than that. Look, we, we have to figure out why they have those things uh, because if the, the brain was injured, it's not, it can be effective, but it may not be completely effective just to say, well, Let's uh, get you on an SSRI to get that depression to go away, or let's you know go through talk therapy or or some sort of a therapy to see if we can get your anxiety decreased a little bit. We have to figure out why that person is anxious, and that's all based upon sensory processing. So I think every person is capable of doing a very quick sensory examination, whether you don't think that you should be doing it. Like for example, uh, a lot of my friends who are psychiatrists, they say, well, my examination is asking questions, but they're not precluded from saying, you know, can you touch my nose and your finger? And just evaluating whether or not that they have dysfunction in those areas. Um, I have always been told you can never see what you don't look for. Um, and the reality is, is if people start looking for these things, you're, they're going to see it. Um, so, and then to answer the second question was like, you know, when does somebody refer to me? Well, I've gotten, kind of gotten this reputation as being the last resort doctor, you know, when everything else is not worked, you know, send them to Dr. Antonucci, and I'm happy to be that for folks. Um, I think that's where I do best. Um, but if there's just anything that I could do to be of assistance, just call on me. You don't necessarily have to refer a patient. I gave you my contact information. Uh, if there's just something you want to run by me and just say, hey, what do you think on this? Um, I'm already so busy that I don't necessarily need referrals and patients and things like that. Um, so I'm never there to say, come, come, come. I'm here to say, if I can help, please let me help. Uh, so that's kind of my answer to that. Um, and as far as the patient, you know, with neurodevelopmental challenges, I think you can look at things the same way as a physician does or a practitioner. Um, you are just educated on the sensory hierarchy. So if you have a child that has developmental delays, 
99 times out of 100, their sensory processing is not working well. They may be have on the autism spectrum disorder, and they may be stimming with their head, meaning they're driving vestibular information. They may be very tactile. They want to touch everything. They're telling you what they need. So it's just a matter of trying to find the person that can help create a plan that covers everything at one time. Um, and I'm, I'm an analogy guy, so I'm sorry if I'm just boring people to death with my analogies, but, and this is kind of an interesting one. Um, I watched this show on Netflix called uh, Shooter with, um, what is his name, Ryan Felipe. And one of the things that I got out of the first episode was he was like a sniper and he's calculating the wind, he's calculating the distance, he's calculating the target moving, he's looking at the weight of his bullet or whatever, how strong his gun is. And his goal is in one trigger pull to get the job done. But in order to do that, he had to collect all that information. So my advice to someone who's looking for a doctor is to find a doctor that does that, collects all that, all that information so that they could be fast, effective, and precise with their interventions. And that may be you know, auditory therapy, it might be vision therapy, it might be vestibular therapy, or it might be someone who's trained in functional neurology who does all of that. Uh, it's just really a matter of who's convenient for you, who's close, you know, close and convenient, someone you can, you can communicate with on a regular basis, someone that you trust, and someone that has uh, the knowledge to be able to be working with neurological conditions. Okay, that's great advice. That, I really like how you answered that last part of that question. Well, I think that brings us to a close. Dr. Antonucci, thank you so much. Is there anything you would like to leave as a parting message for, for our viewers today? No, just maybe just that hopefully you may have been exposed the first time to what we call functional neurology. That's everything that I just talked about today. Um, if, if you're interested in finding someone who either practices functional neurology or if you're interested in learning more about functional neurology, please check out the Carrick Institute, uh, carrickinstitute.com. Uh, they have a doctor directory on there, so the doctors that have trained with us are on there. Uh, they have um, a nice team of people that are a uh, support staff that if you call in and say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm a patient, I'm looking for somebody in my area, or if you're a doctor saying, hey, listen, I saw Dr. Antonucci, he's a little crazy, but sounds pretty interesting, uh, you might want to start taking some classes. Uh, so we can help you with that as well, too. So uh, as I kind of stated earlier, I'm here to serve, so however I can serve you, please just let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. My, my pleasure. Thank you.